Okay, so today I'm going to talk about responsive typography and let's see if I can go full screen. Okay. So, uh, don't worry about this. So, whenever you want to do responsive typography, you have to change the font sizes on the mobile screen and on the desktop and on the whatever screens. And what I had done in the past was something like that. So, it's a lot of work if you had to do it for the H2, H3, H4, H5P and all the other elements that you have. So it's really problematic. And when I started typography, it's really more about like, okay, I want to learn more about the coding side of things. But then after a while, I, I learned that there was a lot on the design side of things that affected how the coding side of things worked. And people are very fixated on the old, olden print ways of doing the type of doing typography and then they're transferring every, everything they know about print onto the web. And that's like a, uh, it makes coding harder. So, so I try to find a way to make the design part easy and the coding part easy. So basically my aim was to find a way to like, you can change anything, it's like a configuration and then that automatically helps you switch your font sizes on the, for different devices. So that was the approach that I went in. But if you want to think about the design side of things, we have to start with the purpose of typography, which basically, if you take a look at this, this is my handwriting. It's like you have to look at, the purpose of typ typography is to help make text easy to read. So this text isn't very easy to read, especially from like pretty far away. It's quite thin. You can't really see the word, the letter forms easily. But text on a web isn't that much better if you put it at a default font size. I'm, I, wait. Is this a default? Yes, this is the default font size for some reason. Uh, it's really scaled down because I'm using review.js. It shouldn't be that size. But take it with a pinch of salt. It kind of looked like, uh, wait. No, it's not helping. OK, it's not helping. Zooming in isn't helping. OK, kind of something like that, which is something that is readable. So if you want to think about something that's readable, then uh, you have to look at three different properties. That's the font size, the leading. Also in CSS we call it, we say line height, and the width of the text. So the measure is what they call it. So of the three things, I would say you have to determine the font size first. Uh, let's take a look at uh, this is such a bad example because of the screen resolution. Can I change the screen resolution? Yeah, please. Please work, please work. Wait. This isn't helping very much for some reason. Used to be better. Okay, never mind. But generally speaking, if you set a font size of 16 pixels and then you try to look at it from far, it's going to be too small, especially if you're on a bigger screen. Because the further you go, the further your screen goes, the smaller the text reads. So you really want to have an idea, you want, really want to determine what is an ideal range between the too small range and the too big range. So the further your screen goes, the further the, 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 uh, the smaller the font size looks. So generally speaking, the bigger the screen, the further the distance. So if you read on, on a mobile, it's going to be much nearer, so you want a smaller font size. If you read on that screen, it's going to be much further away, so you want a bigger font size. That's how generally what it means. The second factor you want to take a look at when it comes to determining your font size is your typeface that you use. Because each typeface is slightly different. Um, Garamond and Facet, they look similar, but Facet is slightly bigger than Garamond because of the X height. Then the third thing is that, well, people, different people have different ranges of like ideals because if you think about it, like I wear specs most of the time, and, but I don't have a short sightedness. So I think it's fine to read something slightly smaller. But if someone else has like worse eyesight than me, he might want to read something that's bigger, otherwise it's too straining on the eyes. If someone has perfect eyesight like Seth, then he doesn't mind looking at tiny font sizes, I believe. So it's like you have to 
talk to people and then get people to look at your website before you find that sweet spot. But it's like a trainable skill, so over time you kind of find that sweet spot by yourself. So to determine the font size, let's say we set about, I think this is about 20 pixels if I'm not wrong. Generally speaking, 16 pixels is too small if you're on a laptop and above. 16 pixels is a good size for the mobile because it, it's almost as if you're on, like you're reading a book. That's why browsers set 16 pixels as a default. Then the next, one, the next thing I'll do is to determine the measure. So if you take a look at this right now, you try to read from the left to the right, you probably find yourself like to turning your head as you move around, as you try to read. If you do that, then you, it's, too, uh, it's too long. Or if you read halfway and then you get lost somewhere in the middle of a line, you know that this is too long. Because what we generally do is that we really know this is a paragraph tag. We want to remember where the start point is so we can get back to it easily. But if the text goes too long, we just lose the, the concentration. So what we do is that we will shorten it, but this is too short because it's like, if you read like three or four words and you get broken up, you find, find it a little bit frustrating. So if you try, how to put it? The, the best way to do is to try reading the text and that will tell you whether the font is too, if you find any discomfort, then you know that this is too long or too short, or too big or too small. A good size will probably be around the range of like 45 to 75 characters. Or if you count the number of words, it's about 12 words, 10 words around that range. So if the number of words is 12 to 10, you kind of have a good range, then it's a good measure. You can continue with the rest of the things. The last one is to determine the leading. And this is a leading for a 1.2, which is the default. But when we work with leading, we don't just want to look at one paragraph because leading is really what determines the, what people call the typographic color of the whole page. So if you have a leading that's too small, it feels as if you are reading it, um, there's, there's a lot of text, there's a lot of overwhelm. So what you can do is to increase the, okay, forget it, I'm not going to do that. You can increase the leading bit by bit until you find a leading that's good enough. And when you, when you try to work with leading, you have to look at diff multiple paragraphs of text and then you try to read it through. So if you find that the moment you increase your leading to a point where the space between the lines are distracting, you know that the, that is the point where it's too big. So that's how it goes. Uh, yep. Letting is the space between the lines. It's usually what we, call, what we put as line height. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit rusty with this presentation, but basically if you, oh shit. Letting is called letting because it was literal lead that was put in between the blocks of time. That's why it's not leading. Line height. If you ever get to a typography museum or something, have a look at the type, and it's also very relevant to CSS. Yeah. It's really cool, there's a good one. So, yeah. if, you, if you take a look at this, like if I try increasing the leading, the line height, like a line height of less than one is, generally, is definitely a no go. 1.2 is generally too tight for most typefaces, unless you use a typeface that has a very small x height. I um, can't think of any examples right now, but maybe Futura, Futura would come to mind. Um, if you use like Helvetica, probably a range of 1.3 to 1.4 is generally ideal. Some people go up to 1.5 or 1.6 if you on some websites. But generally, if you go to 1.7, 1.8 is too big. Because if you start reading this right now, you, you already start to get distracted by the spaces in between the lines as opposed to trying to read the text. And in typography, what we really want to do is for people to read the text without, the, without getting distracted. So that's the basics of typesetting. And that's what, makes typo that's what makes good typography. So if you take a look at it, probably between 1.4, 1.3 is a good range to work with. Yep. So like between 1.3 to 1.6 is a good range, generally speaking, depending on the typeface you use. But leading is um, slightly more complicated, but because it's also affected by the font size and the measure that you use. Do I have an example here? Nah, no, I don't have it. But if the font size is bigger, you'll want lesser leading. 
because a font size that is this big will have like letting is a multiple of the font size, so the letting will be e will be even bigger, and that will leave like large gaps in between the words. You want to balance the words and and the amount of space so you don't get distracted by the space as much as possible. Even though like they say in design white space is important, but you can't you can't have space that distracts people from what you're trying to do. If you talk about measure, then the longer your measure, the more leading you want. Because if you have a longer measure, you want you want to have some way to guide people to the next line without Letting them like, hey, yeah, I just finished reading the first line, and then I go back, and then I read, I read the first line again, and then like, what? That that kind of thing. So you want to make sh add some letting to make sure that people read properly. So that's how it goes. So generally speaking, HD, um, for the phone size on a laptop, I found a good size between 19, 20 pixels. Generally, on the mobile, it's about 16. If you go up to uh, Thunderbolt display, which is about 2560. A good size is around 22 to 24. If you go up to the TV, then it's slightly bigger, and, and so on and so forth. There's not a big change if you noticed. Like 16 to 20, 19 to 21, 22, 24, and that's really like the, the furthest you go. You don't really go that far. And if you want to set a good measure, it's always between 45 to 75 characters. You can use the M unit. Although like M is supposed to be the size of uh, the letter M, but it isn't really that case. But it's generally accepted that half a M is approximately equals to one character. So if you divide 20, 45 and 75 by half, uh, by two, you get about 22.5 to 37.5 M. <coughs> so if you set a measure around that range, that's fine. Like generally I set 30, 35, and see how it goes. I actually looked it up on the M, and it's yep. uh, like in typography there used to be like a little metal piece that the character was carved into that would be put into the press or the stand uh, and then put down and you could like line them up on, on a, and put them together and this is how the, the text was written like in reverse in, if you will and the height of one of those little metal clips that had a character carved on it is, was one M. So it has nothing to do with the width of the M, that actually the Wikipedia article says that's like one of the, the wrong definitions of it, or that like came up for whatever reason. <laughs> um, so it's the height of this little metal piece. Okay. Since that's a Wikipedia, you can just edit it and then be right. <laughs> <laughs> Can you edit Wikipedia, please? Yeah, <laughs> sure, it's all set. <laughs> so like, when we talk about the next thing after, Oh, right. That's like getting the basics to, to good typography, which the, the first thing you need to do is readable type. I'm skipping the choosing of typefaces here because that's like the second portion after you get the basics of uh, the readable type. Next is I want to talk about modular scale and vertical rhythm. Modular scale is how you would choose. Um, it's, it's something you can use to choose the font size of your header elements. Because if you ask a designer how, do, how will you choose that header size, you probably get, uh, I just tweak it until it looks right. And that's not really helpful. But if you think about it, everybody starts with some rules. And if you ask a typographer, like what rules do they use? They will use a traditional typography scale. And that's called the diatonic scale or something like that. So if you, if you just Google the diatonic scale, you'll see that it's the, the one you see in Word documents and pages as you click the type button. I don't have a skill with me right now, but let's see. <coughs> no internet connection. Okay, forget it. But after, after a while, like, you, can't, you can't really use the diatonic scale on the web because it isn't based on the, the, font size that, the font size that you chose in the first place. The diatonic scale works in print because Generally, people already use like the, those sizes as the base of their font of their base size. If you went through the procedure that we talked about earlier to choose your font size, then you you end up in a range that maybe 22 pixels is like the the font size that you're going to use, and then you don't find that 22 pixels in any scale out there. So then the next thing that Tim Brown came up with was this modular scale, where you use your base font size as the base number 
and then you create a scale by multiplying a specific ratio to it. Like the ratio can be any number. It generally, people say to use a musical scale as a number because musical scale ties into like mu harmony and all that, all that kind of stuff. So you can actually use any number if, if you want. You can use like 1.78 if you want to, if you prefer. So using the modular scale at first, if, if you just calculate from a, the modularscale.com calculator is quite a big challenge because you have to write pixels to a very specific thing, like a, a very specific uh, number, which doesn't really make sense. And there's no way to change it after a while. It's like, well, 50.517 pixels. And then what happens if you want to go up one? It's kind of hard. But let's, let's take it, uh, let's leave it there. We will come back to it when, and when I talk about the responsive part of it. But generally, this is how you use modular scale. And the next one is vertical rhythm. Vertical rhythm is generally, generally what we say, uh, you want to have a, a good rhythm across the page. So it feels as if you're flowing with the page as you read it. So the general idea is to set the vertical white space and the line height to a multiple of 24 pixels. Uh, 24 pixels is my line height in this case. So j what, you, what it means is that you, you use your line height and you use a multiple of that line height and you spread it across your whole website. So it's, it's repeated. So if you use vertical rhythm, it, it kind of looks something like that. The line height is 24 pixels, which means the leading of all your text is 24 pixels. Then the leading of your H1 should be a multiple of that, and then your margin should be a multiple of that, and then it starts to get a little bit overwhelming after a while. Some people, when we talk about vertical rhythm, they like to use this thing called a baseline grid, which basically is what people do in print. They draw lines, and then they try to make text sit on the line. That's what a baseline grid is for. But in, on the web, you'll find that uh, the baseline grid doesn't work because instead of sitting on the line itself, text sits in between the lines. And for larger text with larger line height, then it sits in between the lines of the lines. And there are, there are, there are libraries out there that helps, tries to help you remove this obstacle by making sure text sits to the line, but you use a lot of paddings and margins to work around it. I'm sorry this is going a little bit like here and there, because it's been a while since I last did this, and yeah, I learned a lot of new things ever since my last talk. So, yeah, this is this is generally what it looks like on the web if you use a baseline grid. So then the challenge then is with like using modulus. Some people have this problems with like using modulus scale and vertical rhythm together because it feels like, well, it's not really that helpful, and it, there are some conflicts. Because let's say uh, the font size is 50 pixels, which is the four times of the 1.333 ratio. Then if you use vertical rhythm, you kind of want to have like the line height of H1 be slightly bigger than the font size. And you want it to be a multiple of 24 pixels. So the smallest multiple is like 72, which is 24 times 3. Then you get something like that, which is too big of a gap between the two lines, the, t the two headers. Then if you say, okay, three is too big, let's try two, right? Then you get something that is too tiny. It's like a, well, then when people work with me, the vertical rhythm, some of them have this connotation that you have to make this fit perfectly. But what we can do is that we can come to a compromise and we use a multiple in between two and three, which is 2.5. Then you get something that looks much, much better because the, the, the leading between the two lines of text is comfortable. Like this, even getting the leading for the header text, like the, the skills to getting the head, leading for the header text there is derived from the skills of getting the leading for the body text and so on and so forth. So really it's about what, what is the right size, what is the right measure, what is the right leading. Generally, you don't care so much about measure when it comes to the header text but you want to make sure it doesn't, it, it reads properly. That's, that's um, what is still important. But like this, the reason why we can use 2.5 is because uh, if we talk about vertical rhythm per se, we're not actually saying this is a rule we must follow. 
you must use 24 pixels everywhere on your site, otherwise it becomes boring, right? Like 24 pixels everywhere. It's because there is this thing called the principle of repetition in design. And when we're using vertical rhythm, we're actually using this principle without even knowing we're using the principle. So if you think about it, if you are using the leading as 24 pixels, you're actually reading 24 pixels all around. And 24 pixels is a, because you're repeating the leading, you repeat it so many times and it forms like a, that, that pattern forms into our brain, so it becomes harmonizing, per se. Because you already found a pattern, you found a flow, and then you flow with it. That is why uh, vertical rhythm works and not really following the baseline. So if, it, if you look at it this way, like the header can be like 72 pixels away if you set a bigger margin. So like between text blocks, you can set like a 72 pixels, 100 and uh, whatever, as long as it's a multiple or half multiple or quarter multiple of 24 pixels if you want to. So that's how it goes. Um, if you want to read more about the principle of repetition, I have these two articles. You can read more about it. It's like really a lot of like uh, debunking on why people are following that as opposed to uh, why people are following the baseline grid as opposed to really using the principles behind. But what I really want to do today is to go into the responsive typography practices. The first one is to change font size when screen width changes. The second one is to use relative units, which I will explain why I don't use pixels. <laughs> The third one is um, modular scale, responsive modular scale, and the final one is vertical rhythm. So changing font size when the screen changes, I basically started off with it. So you can't set a uh, good, you can't set like 24 pixels on the mobile, otherwise it'd be too big. Then if you think about it, you want to write media queries for that, which means it's like font size of 16 pixels, then 28 pixels, then a media query, then, then 20 pixels, and so on and so forth. Then if you add line height, then you add it in between. Uh, depending on how big your text is, you might want to change the line height. If you, want, if you change the line height, it means you change the leading, means you want to change the vertical rhythm across your entire page. So it's like, you just, just imagine how much margins and paddings you're going to change. That's the kind of thing. But if, you, if we talk about like sizing headers, so if you take a look at it, 50.517 is the fourth four times of 1.33 and times 16 pixels. But the font size at 56.83 pixels is actually the same ratio, but multiplied with um, 18 pixels. So if you use pixels, you can't carry out that, uh, you, can't, you, can't, you have to write many, many media queries just to make sure your font sizes match. But if you use RAM or M's, then you can just basically just write one time and leave it. So that, that's why I use, um, media, uh, I use relative units. That's really my base argument of why we should use relative units. It's not so much about all the other things. It just makes coding much easier to understand and easier to tweak. Um, well, there are relative units like M, RAM, and another relative unit that is really very hot with the people doing CSS right now is the viewport width unit. And the plus to that is that you don't have to write media queries like the ones in the HTML, and then you let everything scale accordingly. So if you, if th that term is called fluid typography, you can Google it and then you will be able to find it. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about that because it's another whole um, understanding about what is viewport units and how, how you use it and how to calculate that sizing and all that stuff. It's another deep topic. Sorry? Yeah, VW. If you go to, I think Medium use vertical width, don't know the font sizes. So if, you, if you're on Medium and you change the width of your browser, the font changes accordingly. It's not on a uh, fixed measure. I don't think it's Medium, but if you go to this... Um, it's Medium or someone else? There is this, this website. This um, built fluid typography is discovered by this guy called Mike. Youth Mellon. It's if you go to his website made by Mike.com.au, I think he uses this viewport units in his blog. So you can check it out, resize, and see what happens. So M, M is a, what is N, blah blah. Uh, 
you guys know M's, right? So I'm just gonna skip this. <laughs> Any uh, anyone doesn't know what M is? Well, now we know. <laughs> okay, shut up. Yeah, M versus RAM. That's what I wrote. Like people have this debate about whether if you use RAM, whether if you use EM. But generally, what I say is, if you need that loop font size, then you use RAM. If you need to scale according to that component font size, then you use M. A good example was what Chris mentioned earlier, and that's like the button element. If you want a large button, you can just pump up the font size, and the paddings will take care of it itself if you use M. But if you use RAM, then you have to change the padding accordingly, which is troublesome. And on a coder's perspective, we don't want to do that, right? So that's why. Then, yeah, that's relative units. And, okay, responsive modulus here. This is outdated. I had a, I had a better um, article to this. Okay, but generally speaking, you can't set one font size and then hope and pray that this is fine. Because let's say if you use like a golden ratio, 1.618, you'll find that your, the, the header size on the mobile will lose to a point that you can't even recognize the mouth. So, like, this, even this is like big, too big, you know, because uh, I, I, and I'm using a scale of 1.2, a ratio of 1.25 for my plot. This is already too big. So, there are instances where you want to like tone things down, if you, if, even if you are using one scale, and that means you have to create more media queries, and more media queries, and more media queries if you, if you have to do it. So, we can't run away from it if you want to use M. We can't really run away from it if you use uh, viewport typography anyway because it's just, you have to create more and more. <laughs> it's like madness if you, if you think about it, like every single time you want to just change that one font size, you have to go and find, dig up the video query and then change it. So what I did is I wrote this like record IP, which is short, which is my own fix, my own personal fix for typography. It's like a configuration kind of tool, and then you just configure the different font maps for your typography and stuff, and then it outputs all your media queries for you as you need it to. Yeah. Also, the the fix for like why my design like why my designer doesn't follow the model scale because you input pixels and then you it will output ramps and other stuff and calculate the, the the ratios for you like nicely. So. The way you use type is to set a breakpoints map, then you set a type map. The breakpoints map is basically a, a, a map of breakpoints of media queries that you want to create. So it uses a mean width methodology. Then the type map, we always start with a null key, null key meaning no breakpoints. Then the font size without breakpoints and the line height if you want to set it. If you want to inherit the line height, then you forget for the second character. The way you use it is to call like include type B base. Type B base will create the font size and line height for the base HTML element, which will use percentages. The reason we use percentages is really legacy stuff. It, you can use M now, I think. Is this custom properties, please? <laughs> <laughs> this is SAS, right? This is SAS. I haven't gotten into custom properties yet. So good. So you should give a talk on that. Yes. Yeah. Eventually. <laughs> then all the other font maps are pretty much the same as the type map. So this means that it's going to be 1.777 M and at a large breakpoint is 2.369. So instead of going into the media queries and then changing everything along the way, you're just going to change that, that typography map and then it, it propagates throughout all your different media queries. And the pro tip is, you, there's this thing called the modular scale library, where you can use to output the 1.777, 2.369, and all the other stuff. So you just have to set the ratios you want, and you call MS1. MS1 meaning the first step, or it's like font size times one power, ratio to power of one, if you want it to be the second step, third step, and so on and so forth. Man, this talk is like so bullshit. Now, now that I think about it, <laughs> I should have updated this so, so long ago. But basically, instead of writing multiple, multiple media queries, the code becomes something like that. 
where you use multiple maps and then it creates that, that media queries for you automatically. Then for vertical rhythm, the problem with vertical rhythm right now is that if you change the line height, then you need to change the vertical rhythm of your entire site and that doesn't really work because, well, in SAS, you can't do that. The only way you can do it is, I think it's in CSS variables, which is, uh, which you can do it right now. Um, yeah. It's custom properties in CSS variables. Custom properties in CSS variables. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I kind of discovered that you can't do it because if you, don't, if you don't use CSS variables, whenever you change the line height, you have to change the margin, and then you have to change the padding, and change every single thing under the sun, just to make sure it follows the, the vertical rhythm. Which is... But a potential solution is really like CSS variables, where you set the baseline. Uh-huh. Uh, is that what you're looking for? <laughs> And yeah, basically, you can set line height will be the variable of that baseline, which is your variable, and it inherits from like 1.4 to 1.5. So if you calculate it this way, then you're using um, the browser to help calculate all your responsive, uh, sorry, to calculate all the, the vertical rhythm stuff for you, which is sweet, but we can't do it in edge. So this is actual CSS, not This is CSS. Browser support is actually it's, it's, it's a standard, it's a spec, and it's going to be eventually in every browser. So, browser support is actually really good. It's, I checked it. Um, you only can't do it in no, just the Windows. <laughs> it's just Windows. They don't. They don't need serif typography. Why can't we do this with SAS variables? Well, the thing about doing this is that when the media queries change, right? Uh, how, how can I put this? If you think about it, I'm just going to like write code on the spot. Huh? I can give you a really good answer. Um, yeah. When you have native variables, then you can use JavaScript to change values, which is pretty awesome. Whereas when it's in SAS, it's all pre-compiled, so you can't touch it. You, so it's like when you write, um, let's say for example, you write margin, right? You want to write margin shorthands, usually the margin, freedom, uh, is it VR or VR? R1 will be like one reader, right? But if you use SAS, SAS is which basically outputs on the CSS, you're like, okay, now at a media query, my rhythm is, well, my, my base variable is 1.5 and 1.4. But the thing is, in SAS, we can't tell when it's like the media query is above 1,000 pixels and then set it to a function and return it. Unless you want to write multiple include statements, which means a multiple mixes the same thing which you should not write in CSS but you're writing CSS. It's, not, it's almost like going back to the old compass days where you have to use an inclusive of the output custom properties set up. So as much as possible, it's actually much better to use CSS variables as opposed to this one. That's what I think. Yeah. So yeah, so don't change your baselines at different breakpoints for now unless you're okay with supporting CSS variables. And that's it. Quick one. Questions? Questions? I think I'm going to go to the We're looking for somebody to do a talk on CSS variables <laughs> for next time. Now that you all know they exist. <laughs> like a nice challenge if you want to learn something new. Um, my, my question, which is really a comment most of what you've shown us here is great for articles and bodies of text but not so relevant if you're talking about functional UI design. Oh, okay. If you still want to be there, I can. Yeah, I, that's what I do mostly for a living is functional stuff. And when you introduce this stuff, you, you drive the people crazy. Yeah. Because um, it doesn't really work. There are still a lot of things that are relevant, but it's just what it's not. I think there's two things that are relevant, but you have to look at it in a different way. Yes. If you think about functional stuff, then you really want to start designing by looking at text that, that just really reach on a daily basis, like what's the, the first thing that people use, and then you work with that. Then you want to think about how it responds. Does it change one size? 
And then it's, it's like if you want to set the font size to be the same for the button elements, then you still can use it. That kind of thing. Uh, it was dash dash based baseline. Sorry? Uh, oh, sorry, it was dash dash yeah. baseline. Yeah, it's the yeah. syntax for variables. It's what, sorry? It's the official syntax for CSS variables. So it used to be the dash dash was a uh, dash dash O from all the dash dash MS. Is this a new? No, so it's like the, the dash dash is the spec to define a variable in CSS. So if you want to have a reusable property, meaning you can define a color, like dash dash base color, like you can define any text, okay. and then say it's red, and you use dash dash base color anywhere in your CSS, it will apply that value. That's it's variables coming to CSS. That's okay. what it is. That's cool. And that's how they look like. They have the dash dash in the beginning. Okay. So here you can define dash dash baseline to be 1.4, and whenever you use it, you need to define, like you reference it with bar dash dash baseline. And then the value of 1.4 is being put into the binary. Okay. So, and Thank you very much, sir.